Hello everyone, how are we all doing? Let's see, hello John Shea. Make sure that's on live chat rather than on, on top track. And let's shrink this up a bit because otherwise it's gonna, I'm gonna keep hiding behind it and I know that causes complaints. Right then, and let me just make sure that I have sent the all important link. To everyone, I have them. Hello, everyone. Let's see. Hi, John Shay. Um, just started breakfast at eight, and now I'm live at ten. Coffee, eggs, and this morning, lovely, very nice. Glad to hear you're doing it. I had my own breakfast at about. Uh, well, it helps if I have the microphone round near to me. <laughs> I had my own breakfast around about one a.m. So, hi, John Shay. Hello, everyone. Hopefully this is okay sound-wise. Um, how about Albert, Calvin Gasberg, Albert Spapsky, hello. Hello, Vision. Hello, Greg Shkowski. Hi, Ian Carr. Hi, Sean Mack. Hi. AV8 of... Aviator 1701E. Hello. Hopefully the sound is better now, Greg. Hopefully. Hi, Daniel. All right, then. How are we all doing, everyone? We all having a good day? Yeah, it, it's amazing how the sound improves when you um, move the microphone actually to um, next to you. <laughs> oh. Jinonak, greetings and salutations to you, too. Hello, I don't think I've seen you before. Hello, Gordon Collins. Right then. Hello, everyone. And um, before we get started with the main meat of everything that's going to be covered, and there is going to be a lot covered today, I'm first going to do what I'm supposed to do, which is please do follow me on the subscribe and click the little bell symbol so you know when you get when I'm doing the live videos if you want to watch them because that's always nice nice nicer nice uh, makes life nicer um but also what was I going to do yes i had some comments which i was going to look at and so <sighs> Michael Swick, you have to be, you got to be joking yet another Dr. Clark lecture. Why even bother having Netflix when I am not a hazard but days behind? I'm not doing this to torture you. I am doing this because... I try and keep the lectures going, um, and I try and sort things out so that it works. Right, so the reason I went to the comments and wanted to talk to comments is there was a great comment from Stephanie Wilson. So hello, Stephanie. I hope you're listening. Mode. Is it too far-fetched to suggest that the Danes were actually quite clever? They could assume, assure Napoleon that they want to be Islamized, but unfortunately the British have arrived with overwhelming force, and despite the best efforts of the Danes, taking all their ships, so there is a little they can do. I think that there is some grounds for suggesting that the Danish might have been um, being fairly smart and fairly clever with their approach. But I also think that no one willingly wants to lose their entire battle fleet. Twice. I'm glad you're around, Stephanie. Um, so I think... I have a sort of suspicion that it does work out suspiciously good the way it falls for the Danish in terms of the scenario after losing. It does mean that they don't have to fight the British at sea 
and they don't have to wage a trade war, which would cause them equally trouble, but they can pay lip service, everyone. But I also don't think that anyone sets out to lose their entire fleet. So I, I, I would say it's a fortuitous circumstance that certainly played to their advantage. Hello, Carl, Carl Gannon in, in, in Belgium. I hope you're well. And also today, I have had a lot of... Now, those of you who've talked to me before about Brassies, before we get into this, about Brassies books, know that my consistent policy has been I buy the three, the six, and the nine in every decade I can get. So... I, I'm trying. I, I will buy other ones as well. If I get the chance, I will buy the other ones as well. But my intention has always been to make sure I build up a three, a six, and a nine in every single decade. And I've had one book eluding me for years, which has been the Brassies 1943. And that actually arrived today. So I am even hyper, more hyper than normal in that my Brassies 1943 has arrived. Anyway. We should get over all the admin stuff and get into today's topic, which is, of course, the Second Battle of Copenhagen. And you can't do the second battle without looking at the first. And the first battle is really a classic example because, as you know, we've been through all the John Bing, the George Bing, all the Bing stuff as examples in history. And Parker is a good admiral. Parker is a very, very good admiral. And I, to this day, believe that the signal he sends to Nelson is not about pulling Nelson off. It's about giving Nelson a reason to withdraw if Nelson feels he needs to. That will mean that Nelson doesn't get court-martialed for cowardice or anything like that. It gives his subordinate protection. And Parker can afford to do that. He can afford to give his subordinate protection. Because he knows the Lords won't be too unhappy if he gives... Nelson protection, because Nelson is a bit favoured, although he's also a bit worried about because of his personal productivities. In answer to Daniel, uh, Freeman, how's the day been? Caught up with life and things following the adventures with visitors and the like? Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Jay Richardson, apologies for being late. Yeah, no apologies necessary. Danny Freeman, the Danes were in a no-win situation. The RNC, Wellington close by on land, and frankly a very good general in Cafart, and Napoleon threatening in the distance. Well, actually, there is the are rather interesting that Wellington, when he writes in his own memoirs, says the only general he was ever really pleased to... It, 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 it kind of, the only general he serves under that he actually pays decent respect to in... Europe. He's very respectful of the one he serves under in India and Cafart. Other than those two generals are the only generals he gives actually gives sort of some uh, respect to and politeness about when he's talking about them. All the rest of the generals who were senior to him, he uh, basically treats as if they were imbeciles, which is probably sensible. It's actually the anniversary of the Second Battle of Copenhagen is going out now. So this happened 213 years ago today. This was going on. In answer to um, Jerison's questions. Isn't it the anniversary of Copenhagen recently? It is. Pearl Harbor. Uh, sure, Mac. It's a lot like Pearl Harbor com uh, conspiracies. Yes, Pearl Harbor was very convenient for Russell. But if it was deliberate, it surely could have worked out better. Yeah, it, it, it's not a case of it's it's slightly different from Pearl Harbor in that the Americans wanted the war with Japan. Rodrigo Vego, hello. Inca, do you need that port of Copenhagen to control access to the Baltic Sea? Pretty much. That's the whole point. If you control Copenhagen, you're supposed to, with a fleet there, control access to the Baltic Sea. If you don't have a fleet there, you don't control access to the Baltic Sea. <laughs> 
The whole point is Copenhagen is this large fleet base and city which can support a large fleet that can allow you to control access to the Baltic. Unless a far larger fleet turns up. And in this case, again, it's interesting because the British... <sighs> it's the Bing Senior approach happening again. It's a case of mm, the Admiral going, no, I don't need that. Tier take some first rates. No, don't need them. Here, take a lot of second rates. No, I only need one. I want the rest. Of I just want third rates. It's what I need. Third rate. Uh, Ian Card, did the RN and British Army talk to each other in this era? The RN and the British Army often do talk to each other. Operationally, they often do work together quite well. And it's one of the interesting things that in history, they often do work out things quite well between them. They do have their disputes, especially at the strategic level. The, the level of disputes between the army and the navy tend to occur between Admiral, uh, the Admiralty's Arch and um, Horse Guards Parade. Uh, that's where the disputes tend to be. At, when it comes to operations, they tend to work together quite well. Hmm. Plebiscite. Very interesting. This one of my lockdown projects has been a Danish Napoleonic army. Ooh, cool. <sighs> what is interesting about this whole operation in Copenhagen is the strategic nature of it. You have a very slow investiture. And the British take their time to do it properly. But also, it's very theatrical almost. Afternoon, Carl, a blue shirt butter. It's very much taking its time to put in place. And that meat is what gives it time for the civilians to get out of Copenhagen, for the militia to be properly mobilized. You know. If you consider how the British could have done it, the British could have stolen up at night quite quietly, launched an all-out assault at night, because there wasn't a declaration of war at this point. Yes, things were tense and sensitive, but there hadn't been a declaration of war when the British turned up. But the British instead turned up and went about it slowly. They even, And again, think about this. The blocking force they have positioned to stop a Danish attack is Arthur Wellesley with a reinforced brigade. You're sort of going, uh, excuse me? And actually, Kafar admits he's... He, he, it's kind of interesting again. He has all these senior generals Kafar can send out uh, as independent commanders, and he picks a relatively junior major general to go and do the job. Because he trusts him to go and do the job. Count Gavsberg, have we invented tribals? Oh well, then third rates will do. Mm. Inca, were Gambia and Kafar involved in the first battle, or how was the experience of the first battle passed on? Honestly, there are a few captains who are involved who are involved in the first battle, and that's it. But honestly, uh, there were no army present for the first battle of Copenhagen. It was entirely naval operation, other than the artillery officers, and I think some of the artillery officers turned up again. And as for Gambia, no, he wasn't involved in the first operation as far as I understand it. So it was more sort of memory, and it was the lieutenants who were now captains, and the captains who were more senior captains who passed on the information. And also the institutional reports. Not for memory. The Royal Navy was very good at this point at passing on institutional memory and making sure it stayed in place. You know, we associate that with modern staff officers, but... Again, the Royal Navy's been writing battle summaries up for a long, long time, and those battle summaries have been disseminated amongst senior officers quite regularly.
Frederick Bigger, the Duke was a very capable commander. That he was. So was the Earl of Cathart. Caff um, he was, you know, a fairly good... Uh, a fairly good and a safe pair of hands for actually sending him to this battle. Derp Squad, hello! Antinian one, I think. Um, did they go about it slowly to allow civilians to leave? It almost seems as if an agreement would be made between uh, people in a room with cards and cigars somewhere. That is the thing. They do allow the civilians to leave. Um, the the a big argument against there being an agreement in some room with people and cigars is the sheer amount of damage they do do when they get fighting. Uh, that is quite colossal. Um, it's more than you need to do to make it believable. It's more like you have some very intelligent commanders who know that killing women and children and doing that sort of scenario in a siege breaks down discipline of their troops, but also causes a lot more problems when it comes to making things work afterwards. It's like someone's working this going, right, and we need to knock the Danish out of the war, but we don't want to make it so that they have to stay in the war to get revenge. It's, I can't believe I'm even using this phrase, a proportional response in some respects. Frederick, brigade can debate, not against... Basically, the entire Danish army is massed to the south, and that is many, many thousands of troops. So, that is the point. A brigade couldn't... If a significant enough force had decided to march north to relieve Copenhagen... Well... <sighs> northeast to, uh, to delay... Uh, to um, relieve Copenhagen... The raw uh, the uh, British army on the ground could have well have been outnumbered. It was not that larger British army sent. Hello, Paul Beswick. The plebiscite, the main issue for the Danes was the fact that the main field army was screening the southern border from the French. That is a big trouble for them, but you again, if I was really intent on making war with the British, the moment the British turned up, I would have declared for the continental system with the French, pleaded for their assistance to come help me from the nasty, evil British taken a combined Franco-Danish force north and whipped the British army, because they could have done that. They would have forced the British, the British could have heard them coming and gone, we're going to have to withdraw. Angus Sonnel, hello. Hello, Kilo 19 as well. Come on, Even in 1915, on the Adriatic, the AH fleet bombarding the east of Italy fired a warning shot. Uh, then, wait, uh, then let the civvies run. It is, you do try and avoid civilian casualties. Civilian casualties tends to prolong a war, not shorten it. You wonder if the people who came up with the air power theories ever really noticed that one. Um... Dev Squad. Dr. Clark, a proportional response. If they do it again, we'll take Copenhagen again. We're getting really good at it. Yeah, to an extent, that was the, the policy. Jerishan. <laughs> France implements the continental system. Britain, call an ambulance, but not for me. Uh, pretty much, France implements the continental system. And all the continent has to technically fall in line, and Britain starts beating everyone up. And everyone goes, oh, we've been beaten by the British. We cannot enforce the continental system, because we no longer have a fleet viable for doing it. Let us continue to trade with our primary global trading partner. But we will do it unofficially.
In Carl, Sweden appeared to be allies of the UK when the second battle happens. Did they contribute? Uh, mainly by going, ha ha, at the Danish. <laughs> um, uh, mainly the Swedish seem to be going to the Danish. Uh, we picked the better allies. Or rather, because we don't have a land border with the French, we don't have to choose. We can just go pick one or the other. We're not trapped between both. Um, the Swedish enjoyed the Napoleonic Wars. They have a lot of fun with them. Um, Russia really doesn't. They really, really don't. But, you know, Sweden definitely does. Uh, if I, at any point I look weird because I'm still looking around the room, it's because I still can't find Command of the Oceans by Nicholas Rogers. It's still somewhere in my room staring at me. And I have no idea where. I think it's in my room anyway. It's either in my room or my mum has nicked it again. Or which would also explain where my Andrew Lambert's War of 1812 was gone. I don't mind her nicking books. I just wish she'd tell me she was doing it. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, the... Derp Squad and Danny Freeman, uh, I, was, I was thinking along the same lines. Like, the RN wasn't so interested in defeating Danish, but rather give them a way of sitting out the war without losing face. That does certainly be, see, uh, seem to be what they seem to have given them. I'm not sure whether it was... Let's put it this way. I have a... Uh, the thing is, Gambia is connected to Pitt and his ministry. So he is a safe pair of political hands in that perspective. And therefore... And this sounds is going to sound rather strange. I wonder if, he'd be, if he was looking at this from a higher strategic level. If, again... Like when you're dealing with being senior, whether you have to look at this battle from a strategic perspective as well as a tactical perspective. And it's very much the Navy is calling the shots. Despite the Army being ashore fighting the battle ashore, the Navy are very much calling the shots and going, this is how it's going to be run. And it works well because... The army goes, we don't mind that. That's a lot of artillery given to us and a lot of support given to us. And uh, yeah, that'll work. And it does work. Oh, right then, let's see. Um, Angus Sonnen, perhaps a fluffy librarian assistant would be helpful. Don't joke, the fluffy research assistant could be getting a pal. My family is currently looking at the idea of possibly getting a, um, a corgi. As, basically, because we feel like having a second dog. Also, because we've got a whole load of cameras as well now for our se uh, security, since we've had the people jumping on our roof and trying to burgle the house while we've been in here, but um, Mum would like a second dog as well to back up Raleigh. Our fl the fluffy research assistant. So, you know. That could be happening. Um, well, this time, the RM was doing things properly and openly declaring war on the French rather than stepping around the issue and using the cover of war with someone else. Well, you know, Gambia is a proper gent, as is Kafar, a Kafkart. They are... They're very proper gentlemen. And actually, I have to say, when I found the um, Gambia picture, and I'm not going to tell you who, but... I spent a lot of time staring at that photo and thinking, you remind me of one of the Second World War admirals. And I figured out who it was, but I'd love to see who you lot think it is, but there, there is definitely a Second World War admiral who he looks like.
How many ships did the RN acquire? Well, we'll get to that in a second, but it is... Um, let's see. Technically, the RN acquired two, four... 18 ships at a line, 16 frigates, 9 brigs, and 26 gunboats, although not all of those got back to the UK or were taken back to the UK because some of them were just burnt on site because they were terrible. Hello, RAF4. <laughs> Don't know if you know, it's a fine idea, but um, why a corgi? Well, then you've got Little and Large going along, because I have a giant standard poodle, and I'll have a corgi. So they'll be going along, and it'll be quite comic. Plus, basically, the idea is then you have a destroyer, your poodle, and a little Merlin anti-submarine helicopter, or Lynx attack helicopter, depending on what you want to rate the corgi as, which sort of goes out. You know, it, it, it works in tandem. Or a town class cruiser and HMS Folkestone. That's good. Also, the idea that the English could be a valuable ally in the future and being too destructive and killing too many people would cause enmity and bitterness. Bingo. And seeing if Kafka ends his career basically as the ambassador and military commissioner to Russia. That shows you all you need to know about this entire war, because Britain are fighting these wars with the idea that these people will end up as their allies against France. That's very much what they want them to be. RF4, may I suggest a Rottweiler for Fluffy Research System Part 2? Um, tempting, but I think the Corgi will do. Danny Hume, the RM were worried the Danish were getting bored, ships were getting bored, sitting around, thought they might want to go walkies. Eh, tempting. But again, the thing is, the British actually don't do much with the Danish ships. There's about four ships of the line get used regularly, the ones they take. The rest get holed up and uh, sat there until they're needed, and then they're just not needed. The frigates get used a lot. The brigs also get used a lot, but, you know. Stephen Wilson, I love the conversation here. It's one of the few things that makes me laugh out loud. Ah, we tried. <laughs> oh, it's, it, it, to be honest, it's what my seminars are a lot like. Uh, I try and keep my seminars quite light and a bit, you know, sort of fun. Because usually seminars, when I'm teaching them, uh, we've had a two-hour to, two to, two lecture, sometimes a three-hour lecture beforehand. And then we might have had a break, and then it'll be an hour seminar. And it's a case of, have you done the reading? Let's keep everyone happy. Let's keep everyone... Because people learn better when they're happier. And they're joking. And so that's why I tried to style. I'm not sure if I prefer 30 people individually or a 90 or so people on the chat. Both are quite interesting. I have to admit, the advantage of it being on the chat is I don't lose the um, questions because people telling them to me and they're me having to sort of joy of dyslexia. I've had four questions told to me, forget two of them. Mm. Pretty brilliant. What happened to the one they couldn't get? They burnt them. I was asking, is USS Gambia Bay CV named after a place named after Admiral Gambia? As far as I understand it, yes, it's like Gambia in Ohio is named for him, and Gambia Mountain, I think there is. And he does he he is really a very successful naval officer, and he's very respected. And it, it was one of the interesting things finding all about the college. Um, and I haven't been able to look this up, but Kenyon College in Gambia, Ohio is pretty a pretty darn cool but um founded in 1824 so founded a few years after this the main interesting thing i've been trying to figure out is well uh, they teach history as part of social science i'm not quite sure about that but i do wonder if they teach naval history considering who 
name their what the place they're named after. But they have had some interesting uh, graduates as well. Um, Alison Janey, the well, I always think of her as from West, as the as her character from West Wing, C.J. Craig, but um, has done many many other roles as well, and produced Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, President of the United States from that college. So it's been a rather successful little college. Very southy. Cunningham? Don't think so. Not not Cunningham, but the, you're not getting far away from him. It was Neptunish, Danish wedding. That was run aground and burn. Not 100% clear if accidental or deliberate. Uh, a few of them were uh, on purpose. They were testing them out so they took them. Very, very good. How to get an entire fleet for free? Fast. Shipwrights hate them. <laughs> <laughs> the plebiscite uh, thus far I quite like the book Defying Napoleon by Thomas Much Bearden it's got a lot about the foreign office behind the scenes politics in it but this is one of the often misunderstood things about Napoleonic war it's all put down as fighting there's actually a lot of diplomacy going on a lot of intelligence gathering this is why I claim uh, why I stand by the assessment that Napoleonic wars are one of the, f the first world war because they do go, they do span the entire globe. Daniel Freeman, is the Dash and uh, the Deutschen class Panther Chief of the Dog World? It's, that looked like something scary, but generally too small and short legged. Uh, I'm not going to comment because I know many Dash and owners who will would hurt me if I said anything rude about them. Um, Dirt Squad, Dirt Squad. Get a tortoise shell cat as fluffy research assistant too. Electric boogaloo. <laughs> it looks so sweet to have such a violent difference. I think that's the reason we're going for a corgi. They are lovely, but they are not. You do not piss off a corgi. That's awesome. Dots o'clock. So Tuesday the Thursday I'm working. Glad to pop in for a a like and to say hello everyone. Take care everyone. For, uh, for looking forward to the vids this evening. Take care Stafford. Good luck with your work. Ian Carr, Gambia, Somerville. Well, you're getting close. I have a... You see, I have a... He looks like one of the... As I said, there is one of the admirals he does really look remind me of. Dirt Squad. Uh, Danny Freeman, um... From what I can tell from the reading, Gambia was a strongly religious man, and that was the reason for the college, which was to be seminary in the relatively wild west. Apparently, Gambia was also quietly behind the abolition of slavery. He was a very, very good, very nice man, Gambia, and I... It's one of those things, every time I teach about the Second Battle of Copenhagen, I suddenly remember Admiral Gambia, and I don't know why I don't use him as an example more often. He's one of those admirals who... For some reason, you just forget quietly in history. And he's actually really quite successful. There's him, there's Duncan, there's all these admirals who are quiet achievers. Who do a lot quietly. And they don't get enough attention. Frederico Vega. Apparently a filmmaker in Uruguay wants to make a miniseries about the Garth Spies diplomatic battle. That could be cool. Inca, do the RM prefer British, French, or Danish ships? Well, they, you know, British ships are best because they're customized for the British Royal Navy's needs. But uh, French or Danish will do in a pinch, or Spanish. Also Venetian. Um, a few Russian. Some Portuguese. Several American. Uh, quite a lot of Dutch. Basically, the Royal Navy is an equal opportunities purchaser. The I uh, when people go, the Royal Navy never pur doesn't purchase warships abroad. I go, no, the Royal Navy doesn't purchase warships. Has no qualms about stealing them from abroad, though. <laughs> <sighs> and this is the fleet which was sent. And I do love this fleet. Um, so, strange requests that they make. Right then. 
I want two captains on my flagship. Yes, Admiral. I only want a second rate. I don't need a first rate. You are going to have... And what I love is he gives him, not just as Vice Admiral Henry in his time, who's been asking for, he wants a more powerful ship. A, he's getting a third rate and he's going to enjoy it, according to the Admiral in charge. But B, he gives him Pompey. Now, I'm sure he didn't mean this to say that he was claiming he was pompous. But if you look down the list of available 74s, there's Brunswick, Alfred, Captain, Goliath, Hercule, Maida, Ryan, Spencer, Vanguard, Dictator. Well, not Dictator, that's the 64. But all those available, he could have given him a... D he made sure he got a decent one. Even the rear admiral, when he turns up, gets Minotaur, which sounds so much better than Pompey. And, you know, it's one second-rate ship at a line, 18 third-rate ships at a line, 74s, 664s. He's got a force of 25 ships at a line. Now, admittedly, that means that he would comfortably comfortably outnumber and outgun the Danish if they manage to put to sea. Because he only captures 18 ships. And they have three, three on stocks. But, um... Still, that isn't so massive an odds that... And, again, two, four, six, eight. So... Originally, when he arrives, the Danish have 18 ships. He has 17 ships. Theoretically, the Danish are, have more ships than him and have certainly got 80 gun ships. So, it's a case of if the Danish had acted quickly, they could have theoretically uh, had one more ship than him for a ship-to-ship -ship fight. Hmm. Well, uh, Frederick Vega, apparently a filmmaker in Uruguay wants to make a new series about the Grass Space Diplomatic Battle. I, well, I think I already talked about that, but I hope they are. And if they are, I, well, if they want someone to take part, I'm always happy to be a historian and help on these things. Right then, so. There's some uh, for Daniel Freeman. There's some interesting debates about for, uh, about that. From what I can tell, the French ships were better in fair weather, but maybe not in heavy seas for extended periods. There's lots of debates about them. Tough Dr. Scott. Thank you, Doctor. Always a pleasure, even if just a short visit. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to have you here, Stafford. Ambition. Ambition. Robert B. Hayes is not the U.S. president the college wants to embrace. Especially considering current events, Con uh, contested 17, 1876 election, end of the post Civil War reconstruction, end, end of the post Civil War reconstruction in the South. I, I know, not possibly the best president, but it's a small college in Ohio. The fact that they produced any president at all is pretty darn cool. And considering they produced the actress who played C.J. Craig, I'll forgive them. They like the Danish frigates. They really were quite happy with those. Um, <laughs> that's what, that's what, the Royal Navy's problem with rear ships is having to pay for them. That is the thing. The Royal Navy got as big as it did by basically stealing other people's ships. Whenever the British government had to pay for them, it doesn't like to. You know, this is why occasionally me and Drac, when in moments which Jamie will not allow us to air on bilge pumps, have discussed the idea that, frankly, the the best way to expand the Royal Navy is another war with the French because we could uh, go and nick some Horizon class frigates. Daniel Freeman, the Royal Navy does did buy foreign military ships. They paid the price taking crews. A perfectly reasonable sum for any that they can deserve. Yes, but that's different than buy. You're not giving the money abroad. You're giving the money to your own raw, your own crewmen. It's a kind of extended bounty. 
And it's a two-edged sword for whittling down the enemy and incentivization for the risks taken. And they were great risks. Capturing a ship is no easy task, and it is a very big risk. <sighs> yeah, I'd like... The Second Battle of Copenhagen is one of those battles where you get to see a lot of good stuff being done and you don't forget about it. For example, it's a major amphibious operation for the time. We don't discuss it. It's a victory. We don't discuss it. Arthur Wellesley has a lovely fight in Europe and actually wins a fight quite, quite impressively. And I find one of the interesting things is, again, in this is Kafka showing how good a general he is. Because he sends off an enhanced artillery formation with Wellesley. So Wellesley is taking a lot of artillery with him away from the siege. Now, if you're normal, if you're a general, you normally think, what I want is a lot of artillery to defend here, to take part in the siege. But he sends the artillery off with Wellesley. And the reason he does this is two reasons. One, the ships have a lot of artillery aboard them. So that's kind of helping. And secondly, as he puts the Wellesley, your job is to hold the line. If you see enough enemy coming, I will move as swiftly as I can with my troops to assist you. So basically, the heavy stuff which he can't move quickly is artillery. So if Wellesley takes the artillery and sights it and positions it to defend their, the main line of potential enemy attack and has a brigade of troops with it, that's great because he can move infantry and cavalry quicker to reinforce Wellesley than he can move artillery. So that means there's artillery position there, which the enemy might not have with them because if they're coming fast enough, they might not well bring their artillery with them. Kafka is a good general to look at, and we need to look at him more. RF4. The RN appears to have viewed the world's navies as a vast showroom from which they could eventually select designs that suit their needs. It worked very well, and I do agree that was definitely their policy. I tried to figure out the last time the topic came up and couldn't work it out, but there does appear to be up-to-date legislation covering the issue. Vision. Did these Napoleonic battles finish Denmark as a major naval power? Their fleet in the 1860s seems a shadow of what the British faced 60 years before. To an extent, they built had a large navy, it got taken away. They built a set another large navy, it got taken away. Uh, they don't seem to have tried to build much of a fur, uh, the large navy in the third time. That's good. Danny Freeman, that's my naval history master's topic sorted then. Is that by any chance finding out when the last time there was a prize money paid? Because I think uh, there's a lot of stuff being done. Um, I would say you might want to have a chat with Kate Jameson because... She, her master's is looking at naval gunner at uh, gunners, and her, probably a PhD is going to be looking at that as well. Um, if she does, I hope she does it because she'd be very interesting. And I have a feeling she will have gone over similar ground that you might want to might be able to point you in the right direction of sources for that one. I'm that's what Kafka and Wellesley had both been in the Low Countries, Germany together a few years before the second co uh, second. Copenhagen battle, yeah? Uh, Wellesley was selected by Cathcart. He was taken with him on purpose. Hello, Roland Cash. Hello. Good doctor. Do you think Copenhagen is overlooked as the Danish are not viewed as a great power in British modern history? I do think we have a lot of trouble with history in that people look at the current nations and go, 
wow, you can't be massive because it can't have been a big fight because you're not massive today. And they look at other nations and go, you must have been a big fight because you're massive and powerful today. And that's not really the case. Honestly, um, the Danish were quite a major military power for their, uh, for their age. The Dutch are as well. But we don't talk much about the Dutch fight. The Dutch wars are considered a far bigger surprise than they should be because of the quality and the size of the Dutch armed forces, which they maintain to maintain their independence. It's again with the Danish. The Danish and, uh, the Danish and Norwegians are, to an extent, one nation at this point, and that works together. Daniel Freeman, Bishop, that's what. Denmark also lost a, a lot of money income when they stopped... Um, Charging for passage between the North Sea and Baltic. I can't remember when that was, though. Yeah, um, that was a consequence of um, the British. Basically, that those tolls had helped pay for... Well, those tolls had helped pay for their navy and all sorts of things. But as Daniel Freeman says, the Roman cash, it wasn't a great fight for survival or against the French. And politically, Britain doesn't get all that much from talking about beating the Danes repeatedly. Mm. No, but it's something which I think we still need to study, because I think it was an interesting battle. And we talk a lot about limited war being a new concept. And actually, when I'm looking at Copenhagen, I, I see it as a model for what Julian Corbett talks about in terms of limited war when he's talking about limited war and he's he's due, uh, he's creating all limited war uh, limited war p uh, politics and possibilities i i do think copenhagen is a good example of this um that's good. did the british essentially guarantee the danes on the basis that the the danes build a navy beyond coastal defense hence no need to build a large navy after the, the polling war um to an extent to an extent. D's Newts, the sound tolls. Hi, D's. I haven't seen you so far today. And yeah, I, that was the sound tolls, wasn't it? The, the tolls that they did between the, for keeping open the route into the Baltic from the North Sea. And it did cost a lot of money. They ended in 1857 after the Copenhagen Convention. Copenhagen is not a good place for the Danes. I, I, I'm surprised. Their capital is still there, but I am surprised. Every time they have a convention there or they have a battle there, they seem to have a bad time. Daniel Freeman, Dr. Clark, when I say repeatedly, I mean droning on about it as some bad Brits do with Germany and World Wars versus World Cups or similar run series of defeats. Denmark is an ally. I think the trouble is it's how you handle these things when you're talking about them. I would always hope that I handled the Second Battle of Copenhagen. I would say the most thing, the, the things I look at the Battle of Copenhagen and the things I don't understand because I do think of the Danish as being a very good military power, being very competent at this time. Even to this day, I like their ship designs. As we all know, I'm a big fan of their ships. And of their sandflex system. I just don't understand how they didn't... A, see it coming again, and B, prepare for it. And prepare for it better than they did. It just seems to me absurd. They didn't have the, they didn't have the proper protections in place. And they didn't just move the fleet. You know, if they moved the fleet into the Baltic... So the British couldn't get at it easily without having either having to go past Copenhagen or sort of something like that. I would have probably kept my frigates in Copenhagen and moved my battle fleet south. So for Britain, then you have to send out two fleets. You have to send out a fleet to blockade Copenhagen and keep those frigates in, because otherwise they're around to bridge your logistics. And you have to send out a fleet to fight the Danish fleet. You immediately double the cost of any operation. But they didn't do that. They kept everything together. And it just... Why? Um, 
Grace Hussey, in the 15th century, the kings of Denmark ruled all of Scandinavia, Norway, Sweden, De Denmark, Greenland, and Iceland, as the Kalmar Union. Hmm. Danny but Denmark is kind of... Uh, kind of uh, trapped by geography. If a continental power takes the base of Jutland, then they can easily be, uh, be easily rolled up as no natural barriers. That's why you. I'm always surprised they didn't. Uh, they haven't built more defensive canals in De in Denmark. Um, Ron Cash. I was on one of the great free fleet. Uh, it was one of the p great free fleet destruction period. Always found it strange. It's not spoken of more. Maybe it's seen as a bit of an ungentlemanly act. Well, again, it's nothing. That, well, yes, there were certainly accusations from some in the British opposition that that was the case, but. When you've got people like William Wilberforce saying it was a sensible and justifiable thing, then I'm honestly going to sit on the side of going, it's not that ungentlemanly, because William Wilberforce is pretty much as woke as you can get for that period. These notes. One-eighth of the Danish government income by end of the, uh, by end of the sound holes. These notes. Russia, UK, and other nations for big interest in Baltic trade paid Denmark to end the sound tolls. Yeah, doesn't surprise me. But still, uh, you see, the thing is, if you imagine if they were still going on to this day, how much money they'd be making. <sighs> Danny Freeman. That's right. Learning from history is a definite must, and they had those nasty gunboats and close waters that could have been a murder on the British fleet. No. Sorry, no. They had gunboats which had two cannon on them. I'm not sure at any point if they were going to be murder on the British fleet. The, the Royal Navy had small little boats which the ships would offload, which could get in the fights with those. But honestly, as well... Yes, I've got 26 of these two-gun boats, which together mount 52 guns. Uh, that would... Well... Gambia would have probably gone... Yeah. Um... Okay. Where's the nearest 74? Oh, yes, you. Shh, destroy. Hello, I am a 74 third rate. You are a two you are a collection of two gun gunboats. Bye bye. Boom. There are now splinters left. These notes. I think at the time, Denmark was afraid of a potential invasion by a French army and had diverted resources to Jutland Pazinica. They were, certainly. But they then, the reason the British were doing this was they were worried about them allying with France. They do ally with France, but it's after this is over. So it's a case of if I was the Danish, I'd have started allying with France and had the agreement done. Uh, well, because the British are up there for almost, for a couple of weeks doing this operation. You know, if we go back to this, I actually listened in because of where I was getting the information from where I and it's they're arriving on the fifth of August of Helsinki, seventh of August, eighth of August. They're there for most of August. The army's on ground on the land from the twelfth of August onwards. The army's actually been on the land already before that. So the fleet has been there since the beginning of August. The battle, final battle is taking place in September. They've had an entire month to get an agreement with the French and march, an ang uh, march a Franco-Danish force up to fight it. it. They just don't. Um... Sure, Mac, the Bilge Pump's drinking game, every time Alex says someone should adopt Stanflex, take a drink. Tempting. But actually, the reason I suggest Stanflex is for things like... Well, for example, if I was the Royal Navy and I was buying... I was sort of thinking... I would say for my Tier 1 fighting units, Type 26, Type 45, those sort of vessels doing that sort of job, the aircraft carriers... I would say no to Sandflex. Sandflex doesn't make sense for them. 
But if I was talking about my amphibious ships, my Albion class, my Bay class, or my Type 31 present ships, or my OPVs, or my MCMVs, I would say actually just buy Stanflex because then you could have a whole range of weapon systems which you can upgrade, which you can quite easily upgrade off them and then put in. And it could be shared amongst this pool of vessels and it would make sense. Because they're, yes, they don't produce quite as perfect solutions as you need for a tier one fighting unit. But for your task group, your present ship, your amphibious ship, they provide you with a relatively easy way to have very capable firepower going around the force. Same if I was the South African Navy or if I was the New Zealand Navy or... Who else has either tier two units or a mixture of tier one and tier two units? Quite a lot of navies which have a mi uh, which have those mixtures. The tier two units could use Stanflex quite easily. It's a very sensible idea. Um. <laughs> then room, never them are makes never look positively mountainous. Mm, yeah. Dev Squad. Dev Squad. Uh, Copenhagen was a good place for a capital. Can't be easily marched upon without notice and easy to sell from doing a bit of Viking raiding. Yeah, but. And it's good for maintaining the tolls. If you maintain them. In car, why don't the UK acquire the modern Danish Navy? The actions of 87 don't seem to have scoured them to us and we can just blame our common Viking blood. So tempting. Uh, Stephanie Wilson, in Viking times, built a huge earth embankment like Offa's Dyke. This is now in modern Germany, as Denmark was larger and larger in Viking times. That is the problem. Your biggest defense got nicked by Germany. Fred Vega, they had ships not under our control. We just went and liberated them. Mm, that is the Royal Navy's policy. Death Squad, if the tolls for passing through the Danish islands were still in place, only difference would be the Kiel Canal getting uh, being further south. Probably. Then, uh, yeah, the size of force the Iron Scent sort of nicks the benefits of the gunboats. You can say that again. These news. Not to mention that the guns on gunboats would likely be much smaller guns. Yeah. <laughs> Only one makes it back to the UK out of the 26. 25 gets sunk. Hmm. Don't remember. Actually, they were often larger guns. 24 pounder to 32 pounders. Hmm. Uh, I've, I've heard differing things about that. Some have claimed that. Some have claimed that they were more 18 and 12 pounders, so I think they were probably a mixture. I think there probably some were, who did have the heavy guns, but I think the vast majority might not have done. Rowan Cash, was the main strategic trade that they they threatened the Scandinavian trees for masts on ships? Reading was one of the main reasons for colonization of Australia. That was certainly an issue. That and some of the sources of tar and various other goods which came from Sweden. And keeping Sweden in the war as well. Because the Swedish army was useful. And uh, it also allows you to get round and supply Prussia. And remember, this is about the long-term diplomacy. Krasowski, I would hazard a guess the Danes were not convinced the French would leave after they'd helped. And that is always a potential issue. These notes. What ally nation during the Napoleonic Wars did Napoleon not try to annex? Well, he never positively tried to annex Switzerland. I don't think they were really an allied nation, but yeah, he didn't really try and annex them. These news. Honestly, the biggest mistake in Napoleon was trying to take over Spain with a coup. I still know have idea why he did because he felt the leaders in charge of Spain were twits, so he wanted to replace them with his family. 
Calvin Gasbert, thus Russia and China should adopt Stanflex. I, yeah, to an extent, actually for the Russians, the Stanflex style system would actually be amazing for them. Um, these notes, Copenhagen, can we march on? Just ask the Swedish. Yeah, but that's the Swedish. They're special. It's kind of like the Finns. They're special. The ones who seem to be less special in that area are do seem to be Norwegians. They seem to be the ones who are... Uh, they, they, they seem to get into the most trouble. Bill Beswick. It also allows you to hold the delicate bits in a controlled environment away from salt water for ships in reserve. Mm, I'm not sure what that's a response to. Jerishan, read Danes. I've never met a more normal people. I can't put my finger on it, but they're just so much in common with a person like me. Hmm, nice. Ron Cash, a potential aim may be to create a Baltic French free zone then by surrounding it with countries involved in one of many of the Grand Lines. It, it did help that way. These things. Norwegian ski infantry did well against the Sweden uh, in the Napoleonic Wars, but that didn't stop Sweden in the end. Ah, Stanflex. It also allows you to hold the Lekka bits in a controlled environment away from salt water for ships in reserve. Yes, that is true. Stanflex does offer... As I said, it's... If I'm building a Type 26 or a Type 45, I wouldn't get Stanflex because uh, the advantages of those having the integrated first-tier units built into their systems far outweighs the advantages of having the modularity. And it's necessity of them being a first tier picket unit. But if I'm building something which is my carrier bodyguard, for want of a better phrase, my task group ship or my forward presence ship, then Stanflex makes a lot of sense. Because if you think about it, with Stanflex, if necessary, I can fly bits out. Theoretically, I can at least ship them out quite easily on another ship and swap out those components and bring those components back to the UK for maintenance. That's got that's a lot. Willem II asked the Swiss ambassador what their 250,000 man militia would do if he invaded with 500,000 men. The ambassador's response was shoot twice and go home. <laughs> it works. Uh, Aviator 1701E. What was the size of Danish fleet at first battle compared with the second? They seem to have built up a respectable force in a very short period of time. Um, roughly the same size. They had about the the, the first battle of Copenhagen. I think, the, I'm trying to remember if it's uh, 14 or 15. At the First Battle of Copenhagen, they have nine ships of the line, uh, 17 other vessels available, and they lose all of them. And then they have the remainder of the fleet. This included some ships which have been built pre the eighteen oh one battle, but have been elsewhere during the battle of uh, the uh, battle of Copenhagen. And basically, it's sort of uh, how do I put this? Uh, there are a case of this was the remainder of the fleet plus the fleet ships they built to replace it all gone. In one go, and they tried to build up. They both tried to build a slightly bigger fleet. They tried to build a better fleet. You know, it's, they'd had six years to build ships. That was enough time. As Cunningham says, it takes three years to build a ship, and if you have access to seasoned timber, and they did have access to seasoned timber. Although, again, the reason the British don't seem to make so much use of their ships is they're worried about the quality of the seasoning. They keep them. They seem to last quite long. They use as hulks for quite a lot of stuff, but you know. Uh, 
Hello, in happy. What is Stanflex? Uh, well, the reason this is coming up quite a lot is Stanflex is a Danish modular weapon system. It's been around for about 40 years. Um, it works very, very well. All the Danish warships are armed with it, and it basically means that you can swap in and out weapon systems on them. Now, the thing is, the Americans designed the perfect system, which is the heavy system, which was supposed to work on the LCS, and it hasn't worked because they went for something perfect. Stanflex was originally designed, first tested on OPVs, then grown to frigates, then grown to the command ships of the Danish Navy, um, things like the Absalom class. Uh, it's also fitted to the Nudra Musum class OPVs and their various frigates. Um, it's a very good system. It has a range of modules. Um, if I just get it up there, I have some notes on it, which I will open. Yeah. So the current modules are you can get uh, a module can come with RG with uh, two quad launchers for harpoon missiles. They can come with a six cell. Mark 48 model uh, launcher for Sea Sparrow missiles. They can carry a 7662 Super Rapid Otto Breda gun. Um, they can have MU 90 torpedoes. They can carry a very adept active passive sonar system. They can operate, they can be used to carry, they have a drone and mine countermeasure system. Um, using double eagle remote operated vehicles, they can have a crane. They have oceanography, anti pollution, survey, storage, and signet and element stuff options. Um, there are a hundred and one. Uh, the Danish navies um, currently maintains. 101 units of 11 different types of modules. And they can be fitted onto the Flixessen class, the class, the Diana class, the Absalom class, the Niels Duel class, um, the Ivar Hultfeldt class, the Fetus class, and the Nudra Munson class. All can take them. They are pretty darn cool. It's a very, it's quite a flexible system, but it's, um, my theory is often it will be better to start with that system and scale it up and develop from it rather than try and create a brand new system if you're someone like Britain. I can understand America building its own, and if it worked, I would be going British, should be Britain, if we were going to use it, should be using the American system. But the American system seems to become to quite complicated and doesn't seem to work as well. So I would go with the Danish system, which is proven and worked, and that would be what I'd be fitting the Type Thirty Ones and the River classes and all the others out with it. Sure, Mac. It's almost like there is some kind of critical mass the RN is worried about, which they never exceed again. Um, to an extent, if they have enough force to justify the Royal Navy sending a major fleet to uh, to fight to get passage, that causes trouble. In happy, I guess Christian VII was the main prize. It was a very nice prize. Very nice prize. Very pretty ship. Very, very pretty ship. Um, I got a picture of her somewhere. Uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> I thought I had a picture of Christian. She was built in 1803. Dana, Danish Norwegian Navy. Shipyard created at Co Copenhagen. I do have a picture for her somewhere.
Ne. Yeah, the interesting thing, the only real place I could find a picture for her was a model. Um, and I'm still not sure if this is quite accurate picture, but... I have found it, and I will open it up again. This is, of course, a list of all the pictures the ships captured, and it was an interesting battle. As I said, it, it's one of those battles which you sit and look and go, "How? Why? What?" There you go. This is the picture I found of Christian Seven. It's of a model made of her to apparently to her her um, dimensions, and it looks like a fairly good little ship. Dope Squad Chomak. Grimmas worry is the treasury is in the treasury and about the purchase and maintenance costs. Hmm, to an extent. Um, uh, and happy. I don't understand why Gambia took the Prince of Wales with him. Uh, she was probably completely completely aggressively and not much more powerful than at large size 74. Okay, so the POW that wasn't the Prince of Wales, it was the um Yeah, it was the Prince of Wales. Okay. Well you have for two you have two reasons. he took a second rate with him because from an angle she looks like a first rate. Second, and she's a fairly ornate looking first rate as well, being called the Prince of Wales, uh, second rate. So she does look like a first rate from a distance. More importantly, she has the height. So her sails were just a bit higher. And her mast was just that bit taller than the third rates, which allows a slightly better view. And there's a certain status. He is an admiral. So, in nicest way, him commanding from a third rate would be a bit of a a drop down, which he couldn't quite do. So he decided to go in a second rate, but he kept everyone else in third rates and kept it nice and cheap. Frederick, on topic, off topic. Why did the RN switch from the classic naming system to the types? Um, classes grew, and to an extent, the classes that came through, it's the interwar period, it starts converting it. And then after the interwar period, you have the destroyers, the frigates, all these things coming through. It makes sense when you have that scenario. That's good. The clock. Going back to the live stream I missed. Do you think Admiral King would have drawn the ships from the convoy duty, whatever happened? EU ships not used or put in too much danger? I think if he. I think the thing is, if they'd been put. If he could have found a legitimate excuse, they could have been. It was war, it is walking a tightrope of using them so that they were justified being there, but not putting them in so much danger that they worried about losing them. In Happy, how influential was Christian VII together to Canopus in the RN going to 80, 80 gun, 84 gun, two deckers? Um, not really. They were looking at it. They, basically, the British were usually the last to go up in massive size because they had so many ships, which were the 74s, etc. And one of the interesting things is when they, if you're looking at this, uh, and one of the things I noticed quite quickly when going through them, and the reason I left the numbers in when I was selecting and putting it all together, 
is that they drop them down. They actually take the guns down. The Norge goes from 78 down to 74, but the Fiven goes up from 70 to 74. So that's basically the British are going, we're standardizing on the 74s. And it's one of the interesting things. People go, oh, the British don't make use of the Danish ships. Well, they put a lot of effort into standardizing them with the rest of the Royal Navy. So they're obviously preparing to be able to use them, but they don't need to use them, so they don't. Ronan Cash, were the Royal Navy using any special shells in bombardment? Uh, they did have, I did think a mortar ship, uh, some mortar ships did show up and they were using those, but that's about it. The army had more interesting stuff with their shield unit. In Happy, yes, PRW had quite a career as like your various admirals. Yes, because if you're a price conscious admiral who doesn't want to activate the a first rate, Prince of Wales is a glorify is a powerful enough sounding name. It's important enough sounding name that you get you can use it without sounding bad. Uh Frederick Vega, I'm meaning the type twenty threes. They're also known as the Duke class. We call them the Type Twenty Threes. We call them the Dukes. It's interchangeable. Um, it's like the Type Twelves are also uh, and Type Twelves, Type Fourteens, Type Twenty Ones. We also know as the Whitbys, the Leanders, and the Amazons. Type Twenty Twos are the um, oh, bees, broadsword class. Yeah, broadsword. I've got up above my head somewhere. Sure, Mac. And Washington also probably given the need for modern battleships of Guadalcanal. Hmm. Sure, Mac. Wasp was going to the Pacific, and Washington also probably given the need for modern battleships for Guadalcanal. More than likely, that. Let's put it this way. The arguments for keeping them are largely like the arguments for HMS. Victorious doing USS Robin duties. It's a case of it's not, we need them while they're allies, but the British would quite happily have withdrawn Victorious if they needed her. They didn't, they decided they, it was better for the Alliance to send her, but they could have quite happily withdrawn her. These news. They didn't have the cruise as well. Big man power shortage in Navy time due to the sheer numbers of ships the Navy had. That was a problem, but not a massive problem. Again, the Royal Navy was very good at getting manpower when it needed it. If it had needed more manpower, it would have been found. Jeff Beeler, afternoon. Are we still on topic? Yes, we're still on topic, broadly speaking. We've been we've done a bit on Danish Stanflex, but you know, they, we are talking about Denmark, so it doesn't fit. Discord, Jeff, as long as the topic is naval history, we're talking broadly speaking about the Second Battle of Copenhagen and the legacy of the Danish Navy and the Royal Navy, and these things happen with it. Now, as we are talking about Copenhagening, and someone has just asked me the question on the Falkland Islands, uh, in my ideal world, yes, the Falklands would get a tad reinforced. I, In my ideal world, they'd have usually a couple of, at least a couple of river. Uh, we would forward base, the, forward base a couple of Type 31s and a couple of rivers in the South Atlantic based on the Falkland Islands wandering around as part of a part of a forward presence area and have at least a flight of F-35s as well as a flight of Eurofighters down there, but plus probably AWACS and, and, Mar and maritime patrol aircraft and tanker and some anti-submarine helicopters. But, you know, that's me. I like my toys. No, I also like, I also think 
I think Britain would be sensible if it was forward-facing assets in an area where it could be relatively powerful and is of strategic interest. So I think having a new literal strike ship there with a couple of companies and marines aboard based down the south would also be sensible down in the south atlantic and i think having these things there so you could have influence and use them for influence in west africa south america and antarctica would make sense but that's me i think four base assets and using the falklands make sense but I make that case, and if people listen, that's good. Because also, I don't want them to be Copenhagen. So let's start off with the questions of Copenhagen a second. Was it legal? Yep. But it was definitely at the edge of it. It was definitely at the edge of legality. If it hadn't been for some very, very accurate intelligence... And some probably very educated deductions. A, it wouldn't have been known in time, and B, it wouldn't have been done in time. These notes. Trying to maintain a permanent large garrison of would be expensive and mostly pointless. As you noticed, I wasn't maintaining a larger garrison, although... Again, a couple more companies of troops wouldn't go a rotten mess. But I was basically suggesting if we slightly expand the air assets base on it. And also it's quite useful because it means that we have a stronger asset down in the South Atlantic facing one of the potential entrances into the Atlantic of the Chinese Navy. And again, I, I, I keep an eye on that because the nightmare scenario for Britain and America and NATO is... China and Russia suddenly deciding they're going to fight a war and deciding to form up in the Atlantic. That's the problem. But that's off the topic. So did it stop the Danish joining the continental system? No. Did it render their joining the continental system completely pointless to an extent or uh, to a great extent? Yes, because it meant the Britain still had access anyway. In Happy, did the Danish ever consider using naval gunners in land fortifications? Or was the fleet kept at ready to sail out of? The fleet was mostly seemed to be the, the fleet seems to be quite undermanned to an extent in this battle. I'm my strong suspicion is a lot of those militia numbers are sailors when they're talking about their five thousand militia. Gemma, I've just got a think in synergy with the last live. How successors at Copenhagen Gave RN in the 19th century the idea that they can show up somewhere and use a conflict that would lead to 18th century Istanbul and Alexandria. To an extent, they were Copenhagening these places. As I said, the first battle, the first time it made a battle, the second time it created a verb in the English language. Jeff, uh, Jeff Biller, related. Did the third commando ever have the task of retaking Bornholm from the, uh, the Russians? The hope... Well, basically, third commando's brigade main point was actually not offensive warfare in, nor in, um, in Northern Europe. It was basically... The idea was that they would hold. But uh, they had diverse options. For example, manpower can be found by press gangs. The Royal Navy don't use press gangs much. It's just one of those things. Okay, press gangs, like the idea that all soldiers are tricked into becoming soldiers or are recruited from the people going to prison, etc. These are very nice tropes which are picked up a lot in terms of the media output on them because they sound so great. And I think it's, But those were largely the exception to the rule. Navy recruited volunteers far more often than recruited anyone else. I think the Royal Navy was usually, it was overwhelmingly volunteer. The army was also overwhelmingly volunteer. If you had a popular captain, this was the entire reason the Royal Navy put so much effort into publicizing the successes of its captains. 
and of talking up about how much prize money you'd get, you would recruit volunteers quite easily. Dana Freeman, more, uh, more legal than Pearl Harbor or Port Arthur. More legal than Pearl Harbor, but I would argue that Port Arthur was probably about as legal as it is. Derp Squad, did the success in taking Copenhagen twice in short session influence the idea to try to push the Darnells in World War One? E.g., we did it at Copenhagen, we can do it then. I, I think that does certainly have a factor. I do think the idea that Copenhagen was taken... I, I think Copenhagen gives the Royal Navy a long-lasting idea that it can force land fortifications with ships. Not necessarily sensibly. Frederick Berger, the Argentinians are getting a tad restless after their five months in quasi-quarantine. Uh, they get restless every now and again. Everyone does. I think that was more, more not taking the Turkish level of technological development and will to fight seriously in early World War One after too long viewing them as a sick man of Europe. I would argue that actually the thing is what you need to do was Copenhagen 2 and they tried Copenhagen 1. And if they'd gone straight to Copenhagen 2 and done it quickly, they'd have probably won it. Jeff Miller, how did Merchant Marine life compare to Naval Shipboard life? Um, you got paid slightly more, but there wasn't as much chance of prize money, and uh, ship owners would do some very unscrupulous things to try and get you out of money. But the Navy meant consistent income. By Samuel Nelson, hello, sir. A broad strategy between Copenhagen and Sevastopol in 1854 seems quite similar. Go for the fleet, only that Sevastopol was way better defended. Sacrificing the fleet, though. I, I'm not quite sure I would say that Sevastopol was well, but way better defended, but it's certainly, well, actually, no, compared to Copenhagen, yes, it was way better defended, but not that well defended. The Admiral in charge of Sevastopol gets taken out by a British Army or Royal Navy sniper. There's a dispute between the two. Frederick but it does concern you if you live next to it, separated by a thin river. I can understand being concerned by Argentinian restlessness. When the Argentines get restless, their neighbours get a bit nervous. That is the thing... Uh, Daniel Freeman's point about very, 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 that is slightly different. Does Uruguay won't need friends? And I know this is off topic, but it's a topic I often talk about, which is forward basing and presence and these things. That's why I say I would like one, possibly two, if we could build enough of them, Type 31's forward based in the Falklands and one to two rivers based in the Falklands, batch twos. Um, the reason is because they could be wandering around making friends, doing exercises, forward basing it. So they wouldn't be based in the Falklands to sit in the Falklands. They'd be based in the Falklands to operate in the South Atlantic, to go to West Africa, to go to Antarctica, to go to South America and wander around making friends, doing exercises, being forward British presence. Because that's important. Because the relationships you build up in those circumstances, doing those, are what are critical for foreign policy, for trade negotiations, for the general level of human intelligence resources you get and information you get on things, and for deterring war. You know, 
It's going to sound strange. Being a visible presence, even if it's with a less capable asset, i.e. a Type 31 or River class, reminds people, A, you are there and committed to an area, but also, B, reminds people of the more powerful assets you have away, because this is your less capable asset, and it's definitely the equivalent of most of the ships they have, if not slightly better in technology term, in technological terms. And that's the point. It's the presence, and it's... It's cheaper to deter to pay money for have more ships to deter conflict than it is to fight a war. In Happy, nice to see the captured laden fleet was uh, were large numbers of sixty fours due to the expectation of using them in shallow waters. That is my definite suspicion. Uh, suspicion the sixty fours were there as part of using them in close waters, but also there was the fact that. They were nicer, maneuverable ships, and if you're going to be using them in narrow waters, uh, again, remember what Nelson was using in the first Battle of Copenhagen was, again, around the 64s. So they're useful vessels. They're very handy waters for shallow, confined waters. We like having friends from the UK. Good source of food, wine, and someone to help keep an eye on the other. Yes. Hello, Yikers! I know Frederico Vega, uh, Frederico Vega, Vega has just said hi as well, but hello, Yikers. Uh, Death Squad, all this talk of Uruguay and Argentina is reminding me of the ploy of very openly securing large berths and plenty of fuel in Buenos Aires in 1940. There were so many things the British were doing. In, um, in 1940 and in various other parts of 1939, and yeah, World War Two was fun. Don't uh, Vega. The Channel Islands generally ship or fly poorly people they can't cope with to London. Often fly directly to small airports and go straight to big London hospitals. It would be a help. It's my theory. For Falkland Islands, if you and it wouldn't be a that much of force expansion considering what we already have down there to slightly expand. Well, as I was thinking, if you sort of could put a couple of P8s down there and maybe an extra E7, so you had some sort of AWACS, it probably would need a you probably want two to three of each to guarantee them in the air and. If you could have more than two to three, that's lovely. But that's what you'd be sort of talking about. A couple of each, or four P8s and two E7s would probably be enough to give you um, AWACS down there and electronic warfare and maritime patrol. Um, for Eurofighters, for F-35s would be enough to give you a very interesting air defense and security net because that's two flights of aircraft, and it would give you quite good, useful stuff for down there. And it would mean you could rapidly deploy those types of aircraft if you needed to down there quite quickly, because they'd already have the stores and facilities for them. And as I said, I would be basing those ships there, but they wouldn't be sitting there, so I'd have about five, six ships technically forward based in the, in the Falkland Islands. The... Um, Antarctic patrol ship, uh, the an a literal strike ship, and a couple of Type Thirty Ones and a couple of B Two Rivers, and their job would be as the South Atlantic Squadron to go wandering around. And you'd be probably talking if you've got that. You're probably wanting to talk a detachment of the RAF regiment to defend the air base, definitely. But you're also probably talking a detachment of Royal Marines to defend the port. And a couple of companies from the army to make sure you have some troops short to move, move around. You'd also want some helicopters probably there, probably a, no, a, a flight of Merlins uh, to do some AWAC stuff, uh, to do some anti submarine stuff inshore. And 
maybe a couple of Chinooks as well, if you can get to move the troops around quickly if you need to move them. A battery of artillery guns wouldn't be go and miss, and a sort of air defense battery. It sounds like a lot of stuff, but then it isn't when you start looking at it in proportion. And the thing is, you're securing that area against other potential aggression, but also you are showing a very deep interest in South America by doing it. And it gives you a firm base to go out and do your presence mission. And Antarctica is going to be where there are going to be issues. Africa is where there are issues already. South America is where you need to build up a stronger relationships. Showing commitment by properly reinforcing your South America, your near, best hub in the South Atlantic doesn't seem silly. Gentlemen, the clock. Aren't there now assets that can do both maritime patrol and at least a degree of airwax capable of radar changing mode at the press of button? Not really. Um, there are talks about P8 being able to do that to an extent, but I prefer a couple of E7s down there. Also, having some good search and rescue assets down near the South Pole will not go amiss on a scale of we're lovely and friendly on the international stage. The fact that they're anti-submarine warfare vessel uh, aircraft as well it doesn't it's neither here or there. They're search and rescue. Uh, the Queen Elizabeth and uh, the Vega also those nice Queen Elizabeth when would their plane uh, when would their planes be operational? Their planes are operational. We just are still buying them. Um, Queen Elizabeth coming down will be quite interesting. Just wander down for a visit. Uh, Dirt Squad, don't forget. I also think they have a permanent uh, have an arrangement with RAF Search and Rescue to fly emergency plane and patients to Plymouth if necessary. They do. Don't forget. Very, very, I'm sure the Royal Navy stands ready to help with Argentinian concerns about fishing by adding a few new artificial reefs. <sighs> No one would like to do that. Mm. Hello, Golden Eagle. Haven't seen you in a while. What's meant by Copenhagen? Well, let me read it off the actual definitions. The term Copenhagenization, and this is according to the source which I'm reading, which is um, a military history sort of Oxford English Dictionary, uh, is best uh, seen as a type of shorthand used by historians by making a comparison to a distinct and well-known incident. For example, it's uh, the idea is that it's kind of like you can say a fleet was Trafalgar or Kyanide. In this case, it was Copenhagen means you're destroying a fleet at anchor. So you could argue Taranto is an attempt by the Royal Navy to Copenhagen the Italian Navy. And that Pearl Harbor is an attempt to Copenhagen the American Navy, Navy by the Japanese. So to Copenhagen is to take out any Navy quickly. Term really comes into existence in America. Um, In that, in 1881, politi uh, political science, political economy, and the political history of the United States, John J. Lala, uh, editor, wrote 
Even when the embargo was repealed in 1809, the belief that Great Britain would Copenhagenize any American navy which might be formed was sufficient to deter the democratic leaders from anything bolder than non intercourse laws until the idea of invading Canada took root and blossomed into a declaration of war. And as I got in War and Human Civilization in 1993, right, Britain's reluctance to Copenhagenize the German Navy prior to World War I, First World War, and again the fall of France, led to British Copenhagenizing the French Navy of neutral issue with the attack on Mel's career. Um, basically, Copenhagen means you take out an enemy's navy before they even get to sea. You destroy the navy before they can actually be viable. Then of we have a capricious uh, dinghy bay uh, that also happens to fit quite a lot of torpedoes and death charges. Our FP8 crews describe their aircraft capabilities. Hmm. That's called illegal fishing is a major issue. A lot of the fishing vessels catch a portion of their take from unregistered, unattract ghost trawlers. Ooh, that doesn't surprise me. Chinese fishing is a big problem. Um, that's another reason why you want to reinforce the presence of the Royal Navy in the South Atlantic, because that could be a very big benefit we could give them, uh, give our South Atlantic friends and uh, South, Amer uh, South American and South Africa, uh, Southern Africa friends, and etc., would be being able to assist them in dealing with these illegal fishing vessels. Going on, attack at Port Her uh, at Arthur by Japan versus Imperial Russia in 1940, uh, 1904, attempt at Copenhagen. Yes, it was definitely attempt at Copenhagen. Usually it takes place at the beginning of a war, so it's an attempt to, begin, uh, to take them out before really the war gets started. So you're taking off the chess, you're taking the pieces of the chessboard before you can even play the game of chess. Um... Mm. Mm. Right. I think I once wrote an article about Sea Shepherd vessels. I think it was for Simsec, and I think it was Exclusive Economic Zones Part 1 or Part 2, the patrol vessels needed them, and the fact the issues they, they create. Jeff, you have room. Have you met Michael Clapp? Uh, I don't think Daniel has met Michael Clapp. I know that Drac and Jamie are consistently going, we want to have Michael back again. We are going to, but we have Andrew Lambert coming to record with us tomorrow morning. Prof Andrew Lambert, my prof from King's. The issue, uh, that's good. The issue with flight to London is not just a uh, time in the air. It's also which airport do you land? If you're bringing in an air big aircraft from the South Atlantic, etc., it's quite a big aircraft. It's going to need to land at one of the major airports. The thing is, getting time to land at uh, at Heathrow, Gatwick, or Stansted, it's going to be quite difficult. It's going to be quite a big aircraft. It's got to be. It's going to be quite difficult. So, the trick, uh, the tri if you're going to Plymouth, you can get into, you can get a slot to land far easier. Now, interesting enough, as I, I don't think I mentioned necessarily with the government, is it does have consequences. It does lead to the in, uh, the um, outbreak of the Anglo-Russian War, which lasts for about five years, the British beating up the Russians. 
whenever they really get in contact. One of the interesting things about the Anglo-Russian War is how little actually takes place in it. Uh... So, the Anglo-Russian War involves a Lisbon incident, naval conflict, uh, some fighting in the Baltic between Sweden and Britain, uh, well, Sweden and Russia, and Britain and Russia, because Russia invades Sweden and Britain goes, we are going to beat you up. Um... And it's, you know, it's basically in 1808, the British send a fleet. So this is the year after Copenhagen. The, well, a few months after it, really. Uh, Vice Admiral Sir James Samarez goes into the Baltic with a sort of a, a small fleet. And when the Russians do decide to come out to fight the Swedes, they find they are facing off against the Swedish fleet backed up by 274s, the Centaur and Implacable. Uh, and they do what you would expect two British 74s to do. Uh, they managed to get a, a, to um, catch up with a Russian 74, the Zvisfeld, and um, capture her. You just it's just not a nice time to, you know, fight. And this, the interesting thing is, of course, the British can afford to send this fleet into the Baltic to support Sweden because they have got rid of the Danish fleet. As I said earlier, you know, if the British had been fighting the Danish, hadn't Copenhagen the Danish, then they would have had to blockade the Danish send a fleet past, uh, if the Danish had had their main fleet down one place and just their frigates in Copenhagen, then to support the Swedes, they'd have had to attach three squadrons. They'd have had to set a squadron into Copenhagen, blockade Copenhagen to get the frigates under control, a squadron to go and hunt the Danish fleet, and a squadron to support the Swedish. You couldn't have had one force do all that. It might have been under one commander, but it would have been pretty much operating as three distant squadrons. So, by Copenhagening the Danish, the Royal Navy cuts down its deployable require, the required deployment force to the Baltic to be able to deliver the same effect by two-thirds. It's a very successful operation from that perspective. Jeff Peter, nowadays, would using a new gun on major naval port like in Portsmouth count as Copenhagen? No. You see, the thing was, the, the, the distinct thing with Copenhagening was that as a rule, you were taking the enemy out, but you weren't destroying... Well, to an extent, yes, but the thing is, the British, when you're doing Copenhagening, you can do it in a way which um, means you can still have good diplomatic relations afterwards. Nuclear weapons don't tend to leave good new diplomatic relations. Hello, Matsumoshi. And um, woke up from a nightmare to see this. I'm not sure if this is an improvement on the nightmare or the, or worse, but um, I hope it's better. Uh, Daniel Freeman, I don't know whether Copenhagening has been updated as properly as a term since air power and nukes have been invented, though, at Forts. Uh, Merzel Kabir, Pearl Harbor, Copenhagening has happened. Um, Taranto, to an extent, yeah. I would say since nukes. Uh, no one's really done it against the major fleet, you know, that you're getting the fleet out the way of. The British did consider doing it to the Argentinian Navy. They decided not to because they decided that would widen the war and make the Americans very uncomfortable. But um, they certainly did do it to the 
uh, Egyptian Navy in the Suez Crisis. Daniel Freeman, uh, reaction with the Swedish, Russian, and the RN in the Baltic. It all comes down to how many Russian ships join the RN? Mm, just, a, just a handful. Just a handful. Just a few. Not too many. Vision, hard to forgive nuclear naval port that is home to many civilians. That is the point. Whereas Copenhagen, if you consider the first battle was done in a very quick, decisive, cutting out almost operation of capturing the fleet. And the second battle is done in a way which really takes out all the fleet and really drives home the point, but also is done in enough time to allow the civilians to get out. Vision, Doctor, just said that. <laughs> hey, it's great minds think, think alike, Big Sean. Great minds think alike. Jeremy, well, we can call Mirza here called Copenhagen done in wrongish. Again, this is my point that Somerville could have done Copenhagen in quite well at Mirza al Kabir if you'd wanted to. Gentlemen, if you don't stop giving exocet allocations to Argentina and allow me to buy them up, you give me no choice but to conduct nuclear strikes on Argentine bases. That wasn't necessarily what the British were threatening to do. Uh, I think at one point there was an idea that the... Um, well, the Sea Harriers had a very interesting missile. Um, let me just check it up. Um, now, one of the things often forgotten is that the Royal Navy and... How do I put this polite? The, in, in 1982, production has sort of begins on the Sea Eagle missile. Uh, originally, this is going to be fitted on the RAF Buccaneer, but also it's fitted to the Sea Harrier Avenging Tornado GR-1B and all sort of things. There was actually an idea given quite a lot of credence at the time, which was the idea was to accelerate production of the Sea Eagle missile and attach those to some Sea Harriers which were going south, modify it, uh, they could have modified them, and, uh, well, potentially them and some, Mar uh, again, modifying them, potentially take some Martel missiles as well, which they had in a lot more abundance, and use those to attack the Argentinian fleet in harbour. They decided not to do it, but they did consider it. Vision. In a modern war, taking out the enemy's air force in first hours when they are unprepared would be Copenhagen, in my mind. Yeah, that's also done as well. Basically, any point where you try and take out a major section of the, uh, the armed forces of the opposing nation um, at the beginning of the war. Aaron Evans, hello. Uh, let's see. Regarding Air Forces, there's also the Six-Day War. Yes. Dayhoon, Merzel Kabir thing is also spoiled as an example for Copenhagen, as it is, after all, a French fleet. 
The only thing out of character is the lack of prizes taken. Well, you know. Ryan Cash, sorry, gentlemen, back in the game, had to cook dinner for the captain of the ship, or she would uh, get angry and start and yuddering about my dusty historical tomes like she was in Germany in the 30s. <laughs> Mr. Cash, I like the cut of your chip. Uh, let's see. Jermak, that's good. Neutralizing fleet had been done right, but give Brit uh, gay British some headaches. Daka, Syria, Madagascar, instead of fast resolving this question. That's the thing. If they'd done it properly, it could have been dealt with. But the trouble is, there's a, there's a whole mix up with the diplomacy and all sorts of things going on there. It's more the weapons on metal ships. You have to upgrade them with all sorts of things to make them worthwhile for your time, uh, or you have to build logistics for them. It's all slightly more complicated than it is with the ships of this period, where you can reuse cannon, you can reuse wooden ships quite easily. Back in a second. All right, then. Let's see. Vision. Copenhagen could be defined as taking out a large portion of a enemy military at the start of a conflict with limited cost to civilian eyes. Yes. Squad, don't you also, in order to get close enough to a modern ship to board, you've probably done so much damage the ship's going to sink anyway, or at least be too expensive to repair. You'd think that, but I'm fairly sure the Royal Marines would like to try it out on a Horizon-class frigate. Right, I think I'm going to say we're going to end this live at 8.30 this evening because we have kind of got off topic, but it was never going to be one of the longer ones in terms of its stock anyway because it's rather a straightforward battle. And the main thing is that's thanks to these two. Um, Gambia, as we've gone on, is very much into education. I have to say, I was thinking... If my, uh, the. The two admirals he reminds me of in his facial expression is Harwood and Pound. I would say closer to Harwood than Pound, but I can't see why people were thinking of Pound. And Cathcart, because Cathcart is a very good general. As I said, he's the one who, in many ways, trains and instructs we Wellington in how to fight a European war, in the differences when you're fighting a European war. Versus the war in India.
And Cash, was there any were there any changes in the Danish leadership between rounds one and two? And if so, did this contribute to the failure to learn lesson? Um, unfortunately, there don't seem to be enough changes in leadership. There was certainly a change in that uh, payman. General Henrik Ernst Payman is in charge, and um, yeah. You see, if I've got 10,000 troops and I'm defending a very defensible position, which has been made with maximum number of defences. <sighs> yes, the place is burning around me, but I don't have to give up the fleet. If I could hold out for long, enough, if I thought they were coming, but I don't think he thinks they're coming to relieve him. And they aren't. So he's right. But, yeah, these two... It's the two picture gentlemen who do the big, a lot of work. Um, that's good. I think that you'd have to approach by stealth instead of an open conflict. Well, this is the thing. The British in both in 1801 and 1807 do, to an extent, approach by stealth for Copenhagen uh, in that it's not open conflict, but they turn up before open conflict is declared and basically declare open conflict. Um... Derp Squad, Danny Freeman, only tankers who have explosive shells detonate outside. Those uh, who have explosive shells detonate outside. Those who have them detonate inside don't tend to say much or anything after their significant emotional event. Well, yeah. And it, if the tanker they detonate outside of is a liquid and defined natural gas transporter, then nothing within a very wide radius has says anything after the significant emotional event. Let's be honest, those things are basically pressurized cookers. <laughs> Ryan Cash, was the general idea was the general then sacrificing the naval arm to protect its own land forces? A bit of self interest, mate? Um <sighs> Potentially, but his orders were to burn the fleet. He doesn't do that. His orders were to burn the fleet, and he doesn't do it. And that is a problem. He should have burnt the fleet, rather than allowing them to be captured. It was a, it was considered a very big dishonor to lose the fleet like he did. But it does save his soldiers. That it does. Ooh. And if we need more thing. It was a. I. I. I don't think. Uh, I don't think. Um. He had a fun time afterwards. The Danish general. There. I do notice there is no picture I can find of him anywhere. So he doesn't seem to have been successful. So if you want, I did once see a video of an LPG train tanker unit exploding. It was uh, impressive. I would not want to be within half a mile. Yeah, that's a train one. Ty. Uh, Said sort of uh, add about a lot, a lot, a lot of more power, and that, uh, and you have what a ship looks like when it goes up. And please note again, as I pointed out earlier, Pompey was the one chosen for Vice Admiral Henry e. Edwin Stanhope, Captain Richard Deckers. Again, if you look through these names, you are having <laughs> well, these are not junior names in the Royal Navy by any way, shape, or form. So this shows the quality of the force. What 
Gambia seems to be going for and quite successful getting is he doesn't want the big ships, but he does want the big names. He wants the smart, clever officers, but he doesn't need the big ships. He doesn't want a fleet of second and first rates or, or a heavy squadron of first and second rates. He wants a fleet of third rates, but he does want the very capable captains, the very capable commanders. You know, he even gets Rear Admiral William Essington sent out to him, who is another very good, very capable officer. Stanhope, for all his pomposity, is a capable officer. You know, this is a, a force which has, when it comes to... When it comes to manpower in terms of the personnel it gets, it's got an embarrassment of riches in terms of its senior officers. I prefer a commander choosing lives with men over his honour and uh, done the other way around. I do. I agree. I just think he could have made a better defence of it. It's... Let's put it this way, way around. If this was a British event happening, I would be linking this to Crete, Singapore, and the uh, Met the Dutch wandering up the um, Medway, uh, wandering up the Medway, and, uh, and you know, taking the Royal Navy there. That is what I'd be talking about. I this is this is the thing. This is the scenario you're dealing with. They lose a lot of shit. Uh, they lose a lot of ships, a lot of people, very quickly, and it's that sort of level of why, how, what, 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 what? Ronan Cash, lol. Sounds like he had the. Uh... Sounds like he has had the Trotsky treatment, destroy all pictures. Mm, that's to an extent, Cash. Uh, it does seem that now. Come on, Gasper, that's good. Not, uh, not that when it rains, 76 2, uh, 76 2 uh, millimeter, super rapid, and Gansford, your MBT quickly loses tracks, fire control, act. Uh, Dev Squad. Da, 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 da. Ah, that was good. Daniel Freeman. Uh, I was thinking in this in term, this was tankers, as in tank crew, not the ship. I was talking about explosive shells changing things. HG shells versus tanker is a much different from wood. Uh, it depends on the volume of fire. Benjamin Donaldson. Hello. Don't know if I've seen you before. Morning, everyone. It's 0500 hours here. Thank you for being here. Just watch the intro videos. Now here for the rest. That's very kind of you. Well, we're here for another 20 minutes, so if you have any questions, please do ask them. Um, after in a, any third, 8.30, I'm going to go make myself some tea. Because so far today, uh, my food has included... Well, let's put it this way. We had some weird noises again last night, so instead of going to sleep at 1am this morning, I was making baked beans and sausages on toast, because I thought I was going to be up for a couple more hours, So, and I was hungry. So that was my breakfast at 1 a.m. Dev Squad, Danny Freeman, deploy spearfish launching mines near the Iranian ports. Activate their scanning and tracking systems when war is declared. The, the, the trouble is with that, and I, Dev Squad, I do like that idea, but we've talked about this before in terms of bilge pumps. And um, the trouble with that idea is that. If things don't go hot, then someone's going to want them recovered. And there's also the potential that an Iranian trawler or something comes across one, gets it up before it goes live, and gets a whole load of technology. Which you don't want the Iranians, the Russians, and the Chinese to have, because the Iranians would pass it on. Because it's such a lot of technology that they can't deal with it on their own, they could probably deal with it on their own, but they can't deal with it as well on their own. And the others would be prepared to pay through the nose and give the Iranians a lot of access for access to that technology. So that's the problem, that sort of captain mind system. Hmm. 
Hmm. Sausage and beans. It is a good one. It is a good one. Turns out, I'm happy the cart near me two miles away is selling two liter bottles of iron brew for 125. Snap, that's where my iron brew is coming from. Hello, John Snaff. Oh my gosh, breakfast of Navy and Champion. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure, but I'm fairly certain that um, Drac and me share a love for baked beans and sausages on toast. I I'm fairly certain. I have heard him mention this stuff before, as well as iron brew. It might be a sign of our age and growing up in the world we have grown up in. Although I am very happy now, my sitting bike and uh, my um, exercise bike has arrived. So I am now able to start doing some exercise at home. So hopefully, my, I will be looking slightly fitter again soon because the trouble is, my body does look like it's gone from doing an hour of exercise a day, I was swimming or in the gym, to doing nothing for several months. Death Squad, do you know what's name here? Except 100 meters away. Um, 100 meters away, I hope, not two miles. So I've got 100 miles. I'm hoping it's 100 meters. Ryan, where else to find me? Twitter, Patreon, Global Maritime History. They're all the nice places to find me. And Patreon, I will be uploading a whole load of slides to tonight, and they will be coming live over next week. I know I'm behind on uploading the slides, but I've been working on other little projects and they're coming going to be coming soon and i'll also record a um four random books at some point this evening on my brassies because i've got 39 46 uh, no 39 43 46 and 49 so i'm going to do the world war ii decade as i'm calling it Although, honestly, I should use 36 for that, but I haven't. 36 and 40, uh, 43 have been the two most difficult ones to get. I've got all the others I'm doing quite well. I've got this one, my volume 1923, my reproduction. I've got a few reproductions and a few, uh, fair, mostly originals. And, yeah, 36 and 43 have been the toughest to get. 36 I still haven't got. John Self, my cycle to the shop to buy Amber is my main exercise, a little counterproductive. That sounds good to me. Um, I live with two shielded people, so I have to be very, very careful. I take the do dog for a walk a day, but I don't really go out unless I have to. Because, let's put it this way, both received unsolicited phone calls from the GP. Not in my mom's case, she got a letter from the government as well. But both my mom and sister got phone calls from the GP. I, if you have any acquaintance with the British health system, which I do love, NHS is it's a very sensible idea in many respects. I'm not quite sure always about how it's managed, but it's you know sensible idea. Free uh, socialised healthcare does work on a national level, although it's expensive, but it does work. But getting unsolicited, unrequested phone calls from your GP is not a normal occurrence at all under any circumstance, and that scares you far more than letter does. John Cain Chambers, when will the Royal Navy be capably serviced again? Uh, they're very capable now. A bit more funding, but they're capable. Okay, Jeffy. Ah, oh, Jeffy. How were captured ships for value for prize money? Were ships actually used by the Iron Worth more? Okay, uh, they would be. There was a as Derp Squad says. I think for merchant ships they were auctioned. I think warships had an accepted price for general type rates, varied according to age and damage. And there was a surveyor's report. So 
Uh, basically, this is where Lloyd's register starts off with their surveyors and where you have the Royal Navy's shipwrights would do a survey of a ship and they would come to a fair price and it was very contested. But it was they were they were fair, they had standard price bands and they would decide where they would fit in that price band. Vision after months out of uh, of work, March August, I couldn't fit into my work. <laughs> when I'm, I'm now losing weight by exercising more and eating less, sounds sensible. That's the other thing. At being at home has meant I've been baking so much more than I normally do. Baking. Iron brew, sitting down all day and not exercising, not good combination. That's why I'm so glad exercise bike has arrived. <sighs> Fred Rivera, GP, general practitioner? Yes. Jeff Miller, Sunday's theme. Well, Sunday is uh, brew ships. And by my count, and I do have it here. Sunday the 6th is really big books. Really big books. Lots of massive books. And it's basically, I thought I'd start going through... Uh, my sort of rough themes are, is it sort of September, leaning to October, November, December. It's leading up to Christmas. What are the really nice presents to get people? So I thought the really big books would be what I would start off with. So some really, really big books are what we're going through. Stephen Wilson, technically, socialized healthcare is cheaper than any other per capita. Mm, yes. Broadly. But it does, again, sometimes depend on what system you're running, although that's far out of my realms of expertise and not what I'm going to get into sort of topics of because we can all discuss stuff. Don't go, John Smith. I think the numbers were 8, 6, and 10. The headlines were we want... Uh, the headlines were we want 8 and we won't wait. Uh, the compromise was the Royal Navy wanted 6. The Treasury and Parliament agreed a rule which would be they would build four, with four more added on if the Germans built more. The Germans are, are started off and they start, uh, announced a new naval war. There was a campaign of we want eight and we won't wait, and the uh, second four were ordered. That was basically the idea. The, the, Ron, the Britain offered a, we will only build four if you are sensible and you don't do, enact your next Navy law. We're enacting our next Navy law and building ships. Okay, we're going to build eight, because we can build eight. You can't. Benjamin Donaldson, lol, he beat me. Always tried to want to know how they value prices. It's surveyors. It's a lot of work, but it is done. My current hometown was developed with our uh, developed with our own prize money. That again doesn't surprise me. There's all sorts of towns which are developed with prize money. Uh, half of Devon and Cornwall, I swear, is funded by prize money. But uh, and uh, let's be honest, the prize money that Gambia gets from Copenhagen and the other votes he gets from Copenhagen, colossal, huge amounts of money. And that's what enables him to endow so many things and be so involved with things. Calm Gasman, re Russian spearfish mine. The Soviets supplied smart sub-munition-dispersing uh, sub pods to the Hungarian People's Air Force in the early 1980s, and those musicians had the option to sit half-buried. Cool. 
air and then attack passing by armor with their rocket motor. And by that time, Warsaw Pact Allies got five to ten year old Soviet tech, albeit stuff was freshly manufactured. Scary. Then here, uh, re we won eight, and the RN probably still had battleship slips to spare for building or contractors to choose between. Yeah, the real thing is the British could have ordered twelve if they'd wanted to, quite easily. French Bay, that one share of all the ships captured—that's a lot of money. It was a lot of money. That's good. Uh, the other half of a development in Devon and Cornwall is from prize money from piracy and wrecking. <laughs> yeah, you're forgetting there's a small amount from tin mines. Tin, tin mine, and mining tin and and um, China clay. Yeah, th 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 that's that, that's a little bit of the money. A little bit of the money. Oh, yeah, Devon and Cornwall are great. Uh, but, but if you go down there, it's just, you know, it's sort of like we used to have a massive fishing industry. Yes, but when you read the things of the endowment, this endowment was paid for by Captain So and so of the Royal Navy in 18 oh Prize money. Prize money. <clears throat> prize money. <laughs> oh. That's what, that's what, uh, from Dirk scored and Dr. Clark. What about smuggling? Yes. Actually, I ha will actually say this one thing. Uh, Phipps Pasties. Lovely, lovely people. reason I know this is because um, they are delivering my mum's birthday present next week. Yes, next week I've got... The, uh, I managed to arrange for my mum's birthday present to come all the way from Cornwall. <laughs> um. John South, what's the only way to stop the Cornish from rebelling? Um, to be fair, the Cornish were never really worried about rebelling against the English. The Cornish were too busy uh, plundering everyone else. Everyone else had more things they wanted. And I'm honest, there weren't that really, really good of roads before pre railway or connections down there south, so you had to go by ship anyway. If you're going to go by ship, you might as well go for the transatlantic trade. It's got far more money in it than the coastal trade. For king, country, and a load of prize money. Benjamin Donaldson. Well, it works as a motivator. It's sort of a carrot and stick motivation. Uh, you've got the carrot of honor and the carrot of prize money. Which works on both people. Or two, uh, uh, um, some people like both. Some people will go for one or the other. And the stick of, if you don't do it, you're going to get into trouble. <laughs> right then. So. Very good, Virgo. Hello? You going off now? Take care. We've got about four more minutes. So, yeah, there's plenty more to chat. And I will end with this one on that up there. So, the battle. The Battle of Copenhagen is quite an interesting battle. And I don't know, I think I went through the outline enough. Um... In addition to military casualties, the British bombardment of Copenhagen killed 195 civilians and injured 768, which, from a city even at this time, is not a lot of people. Uh, as I said, most of them had withdrawn. And the bombardment starts on the 2nd of September, and it goes on to the 5th of September, and it's two days to negotiate the peace treaty. So, again... The point is, the Royal Navy, the British start turning up at the beginning of August. It's an entire month. The Danish have a lot of time to react. And we've got Wellesley is given... <sighs> takes his, his brigade, two light brigades of British artillery, 
an extra battalion and on some troops from the King's Go uh, King's German Legion. And that's what he uses to stop the <laughs> force which is coming up to draw on 20th of August, um very small little river, they have a little fight and the Danish troops are a very which are they're about a brigade strength. Again, they, they have a far larger army down south and they send a very, very light brigade and they're beaten off by a heavy brigade very easily. And the British have quite a lot of success with this. This is quite a successful operation militarily for the British. The army do well, you know. It's one of those strange things. It's a win-win for the British Armed Forces. They do well, they win a lot of money, they don't do a lot of damage. Well, a lot of nasty damage. They do remodel the whole of Copenhagen, but we'll leave that to one side. They often remodel cities. It's what the army's good for. Take care, Frederico Vago, if you're going. Um, Benjamin Johnson, definitely. A ton of cash always gets people motivated. Mm -hmm. Jones up. Should see the amount of prize money the West African squadron were paid as uh, for while they were on per, uh, per free slave basis. Ooh, yes. Um, they got money for the ships, and they got money for the, what was called its cargo. So whilst those people were freed in terms of the moment they board ship. They were still considered as cargo that had carried on the books. So they got a portion of money for that. It wasn't a lot, a full amount of it, but they got a portion for the cargo. It's sort of sensible. It's a further incentive. Roman Cash, are there any of naval and land forces uh, fortresses actually working? There are. There's the Dardanelles. There's a few others around... Um, there's the whole issue with the various Portuguese towers and defense positions, which leads and Spanish towers, which leads to the whole adoption of the Martello towers. The Martello towers are based on a particular fortification, which caused the British a lot of trouble on an amphibious sewer operation, and they go, "Well, this works," and we nick this idea and use it all around the country. And there's always Gibraltar, and Malta, and Gibraltar, and Malta again. And Gibraltar again. Right then, it's half past. I hope you've enjoyed this live. I certainly have. I hope you found Co the Second Battle of Copenhagen interesting. I hope you've enjoyed learning about Gambia and Cathcart. Um, both of them are very interesting very interesting commanders, and ones who should be studied more. And I hope you had a good evening. So thank you very much to everyone for being here. And take care. I'll see you on Sunday for Brew Ships, which is on really big books. <clears throat> take care, Ron Cash. Take care, Greg Sarsky. Thank you to everyone for the questions. Daniel Freeman, thank you as ever for being... Uh, second voice, uh, helping answer the questions and making sure I don't miss things in the chat. Uh, thank you, Derp Squad. Thank you, Benjamin Donaldson, John South, Carl Van Gasberg, um, Carl Gagnon. Uh, thank you, Vin uh, Greg Sadowski, Angus Sonnell, Albert Zaski. Uh, who else am I missing? I am missing someone. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Jeff Beeler. Thank you, John Chambers. Thank you, Sean. I think I've said Roland Cash, but if I haven't, thank you. Uh, thank you, Golden Dragon, for showing up. Thank you to Inhappy. Thank you to Vision. Thank you, Jermac. Thank you, Frederico Vega, who I know has gone, but I still want to say thank you to. And yeah. Thank you, Dee Snoots. I knew I was forgetting someone. And Aviator 1701E. Thank you. And Paul Beswick. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And thank you for asking questions. 
And Erica Khan. Thank you. Kilo 19. Thank you very much. I try and help with making it relevant to the topic when Carl Van Gasberg sneaks in the Adriatic. He might be interested in what's coming in, during research week. What, what's theoretically going to come if I can get it all recorded in time? Benjamin Donaldson, the history books that uh, history books that don't fit on any shelves equal the best kind. Yes, so that's going to be Sunday. The really big books with the books which I have to basically have turned at angles. And I have lots of them in my room and I haven't really got to them much. We haven't really discussed some of these really, really big books, and that's what I'm going to be doing. So bye, John Richardson. Bye, everyone. Hope you've had a nice evening. Thank you for being here. Take care. Um, please do subscribe, click that little bell, and also look at Patreon for the slides and Twitter and all the other things, because it's always nice to see you all there. And um, hope you've enjoyed this week's Bilge Pumps. Next week will be that will come out will be episode fourteen, which is with Commander Salamander, and the week after that will be episode fifteen with Andrew Lambert, Professor Andrew Lambert, my prof from King's, where I did my PhD, the Lawton Chair of Naval History, and it's going to be spectacular. We haven't we're recording it tomorrow morning, but it's going to be really cool. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Wrong one to click, right one to click. Might need to turn the dot volume down. Really, Greg? Uh, we might need to. Anyway, thank you. Take care.